So typically, when traditional campuses are developing a new CBE program, they begin by layering the special student support uh, kinds of requirements onto their usual operations. And faculty are still taking the responsibility for most of the course development, delivery, creation, and certainly grading of assignments, as well as the academic support for students who are progressing through the course materials at their own pace. Now, the most effective programs then add an academic mentor or coach or advisor, and you've heard examples of that today. But this is an individual who pays close attention to the student's progress and intervenes when there's a risk of a student falling behind. Now, while this additional support usually results in higher student persistence, this has the result also of adding costs to the institution for delivering the course. Now, the challenge for creating a sustainable CBE program is to simultaneously maximize the quantity and the quality of the services provided and at the same time reduce the costs associated with providing those services. And you've heard some strategies today already. But the key lies in utilizing people in the most effective and efficient way possible. And this requires a systematic assessment of the activities that must be performed in order to ensure student and institutional success. And in broad terms, those activities include, as you can kind of see here, um, recruiting, enrolling, and orienting students to the program and institutional requirements, designing the curricular and individual courses, as well as the learning experiences, providing teaching and learning experiences themselves, assessing the extent to which colleges have mastered the curricular content, and providing the array of academic and student support services uh, that make timely progress for the completion uh, a possibility or a probability. Once the uh, necessary or desirable sets of activities is actually specified, then we need to consider the resources we need to perform them. And in doing so, uh, we need to think about those and how they can be cost effective. The objective here is not to find the cheapest way to do something. The objective is to find a cheaper way to do a better job. So we need a good educational model, but we also need a good business model. Um, and in making the choices uh, of what we're doing, we have to start with considering the revenue side of the model, are you looking at course fees or fees by course or some kind of subscription model? And then in creating uh, or in making those choices, we need to think about uh, what kinds of resources or people are really needed in which activities to begin to ask some of the following questions. So things like which activities must be performed by full-time faculty to ensure the integrity and quality of the program, and which activities could be performed by other types of employees, part-time faculty, academic coaches, counselors, et cetera, and which activities could be accomplished by acquiring services from external vendors or providers. Uh, activities such as academic tutoring or the use of help desks, personalized learning resources, or the development of assessment tools um, that may be industry-oriented and used in specifically vocational programs. Now, the calculation routines embedded in the model we're going to show you in just a minute have proven very useful to the community college presidents, academic officers, and business officers at about 10 different institutions or systems who've tested it. However, it may be that its real benefit is as a reminder of the degrees of freedom that institutions really have and what their academic leaders can do in organizing learning experiences and using different kinds of people and resources to provide those experiences. And the list of activities contained in the model also serve as a reminder of the important role played by student support services in helping students achieve their success. So let's, let's look at some of the components of this, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dennis to really show you how it works. 
the basic structure is really looking at the resources used uh, and the types of activities that are required. And here's a basic example of the kinds of resources that might be used uh, in various categories. We've sort of lopped off the other end, but it gives you a sense of, of what those are. And you can then, uh, as you're doing that, you're setting up kind of baskets of activities that have to do with course or program development. Now, in addition to that, we have to look at course delivery activities. And here's some of those that you can see on your screen right now. I'll let you quickly read through them. But we also need program support activities, as they're listed here. And this is a, uh, we've, we found that this list is pretty comprehensive and tends to fit in most circumstances. Now, Dennis is going to uh, really demonstrate the model in just a second here. And it will be available later this month from NCHEMS, again, the National Center for Higher Education Management Systems. And it is an open resource. So that means it's free to download. And now we're going to turn this over to a tricky screen sharing activity. And we'll let Dennis and Matt take over. Do. Sorry for the interlude here, folks. Actually, if we can start right here, that would be great. I apologize. I was on mute. OK. You going to take it now, Sally? Yep. OK. So typically, when traditional campuses are developing a new CBE program, they begin by layering the special student support uh, kinds of requirements onto their usual operations. And faculty are still taking the responsibility for most of the course development, delivery, creation, and certainly grading of assignments, as well as the academic support for students who are progressing through the course materials at their own pace. Now, the most effective programs then add an academic mentor or coach or advisor. And you've heard examples of that today. But this is an individual who pays close attention to the student's progress and intervenes when there's a risk of a student falling behind. Now, while this additional support usually results in higher student persistence, this has the result also of adding costs to the institution for delivering the course. Now, the challenge for creating a sustainable CBE program is to simultaneously maximize the quantity and the quality of the services provided and at the same time reduce the costs associated with providing those services. And you've heard some strategies today already. But the key lies in utilizing people in the most effective and efficient way possible. And this requires a systematic assessment of the activities that must be performed in order to ensure student and institutional success. And in broad terms, those activities include, as you can kind of see here, um, recruiting, enrolling, and orienting students to the program and institutional requirements, designing the curricular and individual courses, as well as the learning experiences, providing teaching and learning experiences themselves, assessing the extent to which colleges have mastered the curricular content, and providing the array of academic and student support services uh, that make timely progress for the completion uh, a possibility or a probability. Once the uh, necessary or desirable sets of activities is actually specified, then we need to consider the resources we need to perform them. And in doing so, uh, we need to think about those and how they can be cost effective. The objective here is not to find the cheapest way to do something. The objective is to find a cheaper way to do a better job. So we need a good educational model, but we also need a good business model. Um, and in making the choices uh, of what we're doing, we have to start with considering the revenue side of the model. Are you looking at course fees or fees by course or some kind of subscription model? 
And then in creating uh, or in making those choices, we need to think about uh, what kinds of resources or people are really needed in which activities to begin to ask some of the following questions. So things like which activities must be performed by full-time faculty to ensure the integrity and quality of the program, and which activities could be performed by other types of employees, part-time faculty, academic coaches, counselors, etc., and which activities could be accomplished by acquiring services from external vendors or providers. Uh, activities such as academic tutoring or the use of help desks, personalized learning resources, or the development of assessment tools um, that may be industry-oriented and used in specifically vocational programs. Now, the calculation routines embedded in the model we're going to show you in just a minute have proven very useful to the community college presidents, academic officers, and business officers at about 10 different institutions or systems who've tested it. However, it may be that its real benefit is as a reminder of the degrees of freedom that institutions really have and what their academic leaders can do in organizing learning experiences and using different kinds of people and resources to provide those experiences. And the list of activities contained in the model also serve as a reminder of the important role played by student support services in helping students achieve their success. So let's, let's look at some of the components of this, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dennis to really show you how it works. The basic structure is really looking at the resources used uh, and the types of activities that are required. And here's a basic example of the kinds of resources that might be used uh, in various categories. We've sort of lopped off the other end, but it gives you a sense of, of what those are. And you can then, uh, as you're doing that, you're setting up kind of baskets of activities that have to do with course or program development. Now, in addition to that, we have to look at course delivery activities. And here's some of those that you can see on your screen right now. I'll let you quickly read through them. But we also need program support activities, as they're listed here. And this is a, uh, we've, we found that this list is pretty comprehensive and tends to fit in most circumstances. Now, Dennis is going to uh, really demonstrate the model in just a second here. And it will be available later this month from NCHEMS, again, the National Center for Higher Education Management Systems. And it is an open resource. So that means it's free to download. And now we're going to turn this over to a tricky screen sharing activity. And we'll let Dennis and Matt take over. OK. Uh, as Sally said, this model is really developed as a collaborative effort with 10 community colleges that are working on CBE programs. Sally and I trucked around and talked to an awful lot of people. And they helped us both list the sets of resources that we should attend to but also made sure that the array of activities were as complete as possible. Uh, the model starts off with a revenue component. And one of the things, and I want to come back to, to Paul's point about scale solves everything, uh, you see here that in year one, costs exceed revenues when the enrollment numbers are at a level of 700. But if we go up there and double that enrollment number to 1,400, all of a sudden the revenue exceeds expenditures or costs, and the model becomes viable not just in the long run, but in the short run as well. The model is designed to have a minimum of inputs. Uh, it requires the user to put in an <coughs> estimate 
of the costs of various types of resources. So what's the annual salary of a full-time faculty member, a part-time faculty member, et cetera. Uh, and it requires the, uh, then the user to estimate how much of that resource is allocated to various activities in the model. So uh, if we then go down to course design, and we're <laughs> not going to walk you through all pieces of this model, but I will just say that on the course design component of the activities, the data are entered as FTEs. In the other parts of the model, the entries are numbers of students that can be served by an individual faculty member, coach, whatever. So if we go back to uh, course design, this is uh, real data from an institution that will remain unnamed. Uh, but you know, <laughs> they had lots of faculty time and instructional designer time built into the design of their courses. But the reality is that the faculty member really needs to spend the time in designing course specifications. So if we wipe out develop learning materials, have the faculty member selecting learning materials at about 0.02 or thereabouts, uh, not involved in data collection, uh, but still heavily involved in designing and selecting assessments, and then get the instructional designer out of the business of designing course specifications. But they do develop learning materials. They don't get involved in developing and collecting data. So, <laughs> and then the dean, at the end of it all, needs to take a look at data collection and improvement. He needs to look at that, but not at the rest of it. Uh, and so the, ad, the thing that we would add would be an institutional researcher in the design and collection of, act, of data and make that a 0 0.05 changes the allocation of people to activities. Let's go see what it does to the revenue cost mix. And even if you drop the revenue or the enrollments back to 700, that change in allocation of people to activity to really a more reasonable uh, set of expectations about who does what makes this viable over the long run. Uh, the model is designed as a heuristic, not as a see how much time you can spend doing cost analysis. The people that have test driven this have taken no more than two hours to populate it with the data from their institution and put their policy makers in a position where they can drive it, test drive it, and see what the consequences of alternative ways of staffing and organizing the delivery of competency-based education. And with that, I think we'll turn it to that and questions and answers uh, from people in, that are participating, and if they don't have any, then I think CAD will probably have some questions anyway. Thank you, Dennis. Okay. This is Thad. Uh, I think uh, we're in the process of uh, moving the screen over. Um, but while, while that's taking place, um, Dennis, I wanted to start and ask you um, and Sally about this, um, you know, the finance model that you're working on. You know, Dennis, what have you learned from investigating, you know, the various scenarios? You, you mentioned that you've been working with different institutions on this model. I mean, two things really make the difference. One I've already mentioned, which is scale. 
And the second is, at the end of the day, it's how you use people. Uh, and the question is, you know, if, if you have the most expensive people, i.e., your full-time faculty, doing everything, then <coughs> you will not have a sustainable model. Uh, that you, ne you need to find those activities where they are essential and then substitute for them uh, coaches, other kinds of personnel in functions or activities where faculty members' time is not essential to delivery of the course and more particularly to its quality. Uh, thanks, Dennis. Um, you know, given that answer, Sally, um, you know, about that it, two key areas are, are, are scale and how you use people, you know, how can institutional leaders you know, use the sustainability model to, to help their decision making as they're looking at CBE programs? Sure. You know, a, a piece of this that I think is most institutional leaders, and, and that includes academic officers and business officers and the presidents or chancellors, haven't thought in the way that working through this model allows them to think. So that instead of just saying, oh, we have a faculty member and he or she is assigned here, and then we'll add this and we'll add that. This is helping those, those leaders think through what's really involved in the academic develop or the development of academic programs and courses and the delivery and support of those as well as the assessment of those. And breaking it down in a way that actually gives you some framework of uh, where those costs are and who you might choose to have do different pieces of it. Now, in cases where this is just beginning, it becomes a way of having a broader conversation with other members of the academic community. So it's not just, oh gosh, we have to change everything. It is rather when the leadership really understands the framework about having both a good uh, academic model and a, a good business model, they can then share that in ways with faculty and support staff and other staff at a college or university to help them play through ways in which this might work well. Thanks, Sally. Um, as we've mentioned before, uh, if you want to ask questions of our panel, um, please feel free to um, tweet them at uh, hashtag CBE4CC.com. I mean, sorry, without the .com, hashtag CBE4CC. And um, one of those uh, Twitter questions, uh, Sally, I want to direct to you, um, and it's about adaptive learning. Um, I, I think the WGU is using some ad adaptive learning systems. Um, can, you, can you answer a little bit, what is an adaptive learning system, and um, how does it uh, affect CBE? Sure. Um, when, when we think of uh, adaptive learning, Thad, we're really talking about uh, the kinds of things that were being done at uh, initially Carnegie Mellon University, I think, although others have done it in the past. Uh, over, oh gosh, they started this 15 plus years ago with the notion of building into a learning environment frequent uh, queries with regard to the knowledge that a student has yet acquired and then helping the student uh, either uh, move in a direction that helps him or her acquire the specific information that is needed in order to be successful with uh, moving through the program um, or moving in different ways through an automated structure. So it's, it's really one-on-one -on -one Socratic teaching but utilizing um, computers, et cetera, uh, that allow that individualized instruction. Uh, super, thanks. Um, you know, that's a good segue to, I want to um, back up and, and uh, talk with, with Tom uh, at Broward and Nancy at Sinclair. You started off talking about, you know, integrating CB into programs, you know, or, or CBE programs into existing structures. You know, Nancy, um, how is it that the integration of CB uh, systems, you know, how does that relate to our overall uh, um, talk here today on sustainability. 
Well, actually, the integration was the key piece of our sustainability plan. Um, we had grant funding to develop this program, but we were expected to sustain it at the end of the grant uh, without any additional funding. So we integrated, as I said, into the existing college structures so that we would not have to add any staffing. And um, you know, we tried to make our processes more efficient and automate them where we could and offload um, routine activities to administrative staff to free up the professional staff and the faculty um, where their expertise was most needed. So, um, Super. That, yeah, that relates to what Dennis and Sally were talking about, about the finance model and how you use right. people. Right, yeah. Um, Thomas, uh, or, uh, uh, from Broward College, um, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, what are some of the lessons you've learned about scaling a CBE program? Good question. <laughs> Stay away from the manual workarounds. Use the systems. Find out how you can use the systems. If you don't, things are going to always fall through the cracks. To be able to scale, we had to actually go and learn parts of our system that we didn't know were possible. Um, people are used to using the system a certain way. People are set in their ways. And you, you have to find out what the systems are capable of doing to find the best solution. But I, I would say probably the the best lesson is to definitely stay away from the manual workarounds. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, the uh, I want to turn to, you know, we only have a couple of minutes left, uh, but I want to turn quickly to the state collaborations. Um, uh, Mark Jenkins is from Washington State Board for Community and Technical College. Paul Addison is from Ivy Tech in Indiana. And Judith is from the um, Texas A&M University. I may not get to um, all of you, but I want to start uh, by asking, you know, just briefly of, uh, of Mark uh, in Washington, um, you know, what's the most single most important problem, you know, you're seeking to solve as you, as you make your program a success statewide? I think the problem uh, we're looking at solving initially is actually coordinating our marketing efforts so that we're sending out a single message, but it's sing, uh, sending it out through diverse channels at all the colleges that are involved. I feel like, well, I wasn't kidding when I said that scale would um, solve all our problems. If we do that, if we coordinate our marketing, if we get students, if we get people, more people in the program, that actually will support our curriculum revision and make our choice of OER much more rational. It will, uh, it will encourage and motivate investment from other colleges. That just getting an initial cohort and demonstrating success is our key challenge to sustainability at this time. Super. Um, I want to thank everybody for the questions they've um, posted on, on um, hashtag CBE4CC. We'll take the rest of them offline uh, through email. Um, please continue to populate um, uh, Twitter with your questions, and we'll get to them. There's been some great questions about the financial model and the operational cost. How much does the upfront investment typically cost for CBE? Um, we'll, we'll handle those offline, and we'll also be able to put some of those answers on um, at, at the site uh, for uh, cbinfo.org. Um, I want to turn it back over now to, um, to Sally. All right. Thank you very much, Thad. Um, I, I want to just say thank you for joining us today. I think we've shared a huge amount of information. And I did want to let you know that the first issue of the Journal for Competency-Based Education is now available. And you can go to the cbeinfo.org website and get the link. Um, it's free to download. Uh, it's a pretty good issue, I must say. In addition to that, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, we are talking about uh, resuming this uh, schedule or, or these webcasts in the fall. So if you have topics that you're interested in being sure to be covered, you know, please send them, tweet them to us at the hashtag CBE for CC and we'll be able to pick up on them, pick up on them, because uh, I think that'll be a, a very nice set of inputs to figure out what's the next step in this series. 
So again, thank you all so very much, and thank you very much to our presenters. Really appreciate it, and enjoy your summer.